Hello, welcome to The Offshoot. I'm the host, Lee Sean Nelson. Today we have Jeffrey Richardson, someone who has been a political activist here in Washington, D.C. for a great number of years. Jeffrey, welcome to The Offshoot. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> I'm very happy to have you. So before we begin, tell the audience a little bit about yourself, your background. All right, so I am uh, Jeffrey Richardson. Um, I'm a coach, advisor, and trainer. I'm a social worker by uh, by training. Um, I've spent most of the last 20 years working in the nonprofit public sector um, in government and politics um, from community engagement issues around youth and community development uh, to heavily involved in LGBTQ advocacy um, in my political work, uh, former roles with the Democratic Party, um, having been the former director of the mayor's office of LGBTQ affairs here in the District of Columbia for former mayor. Um, as so, also very much involved in the national service work. I'm a, I'm a AmeriCorps alum, and now I work with nonprofits and community-based organizations to maximize impact. All right, so that's a lot. So <laughs> that's a whole lot. I'm not going to try to repeat that. <laughs> so let's get into this. So as you know, the offshoot is all about asking a couple of questions. Uh, how do we advocate for making Black Americans, Native Americans, a protected class of people? What does it look like? Is it even possible? Okay, or do we already have protections? So let me ask you that first question. Do you think that there should be protections for black Americans uh, given your background and the world that you worked in? Uh, yes, I think there, there should be protections for all Americans, first off. Um, I think, you know, the, the fact that we sit here where we are in 2022 and we as black Americans with the documented history um, of slavery, um, of uh, economic... Uh, just uh, reduced access intentionally, right? Kept out of economic systems. Um, okay. Uh, the fact that we have to have the conversation, should there be protections, given what we know still mm -hmm. today, uh, that there are uh, institutional blockades from us accessing economic opportunities, lawsuits still going on about folks being able to buy into industries. Uh, so yes, yes, I think for me the question is, what is our strategy now for ensuring that we are protecting ourselves and that we are uh, making the systems that we have built, right, whether they want to acknowledge it or not, mm -hmm. and that we are actively a part of, um, acknowledge that history and then uh, give us access to our equity, which includes those protections. Okay, so are you speaking for, like you said, all Americans or specifically for Black Americans and Native Americans? No, I'm specifically speaking for Black Americans and Native Americans. I say that, you know, for me, it is a no-brainer. Like, given that we sit here today and yeah. that we document and accept the mm -hmm. history of oppression and exploitation yeah. of African Americans and Native Americans, um, even to this day, we talk about the inequity um, of the, uh, the being the backbone of culture that generates yeah. economic opportunity and power you, and power, but and financial growth. Yeah, wealth and growth. But yet we we are institutionally and systematically still limited from those opportunities. And so for me, it is an automatic yes and no and no brainer um, that because we know that those. Mm -hmm. institutional blockades and barriers uh, still exist, mm -hmm. that yes, this should not be a debate. We know our history. we It's documented. Yep. We know what is present day going on. I mean, there, there are lawsuits, you know, often happening. Um, so yes, protections are needed. Okay. So with that being said, then your world, uh, let's say in politics, where do you see protections being needed? Uh, say in the world of politics, you worked in D.C. government, you worked for the mayor's office, and it came. Well, I think that, you know, I think when you sort of have to sort of look across the different issue areas, I think there are a lot of, um, at the local and state level, there are a lot of um, regulations and things that are on the books that we often aren't aware of. Um, I think there are, there are, there's a lot of enforcement that needs to be done. Um, I think we need the right people, um, particularly in our judiciary, um, related positions, I think about in the District of Columbia, thinking about our attorney, you know, our new attorney general. Um, so there are a lot of protections in some places, both locally and federally, that can be enforced on our behalf. But we, but the right people are not at the table to make sure that those conversations are happening and okay, that those then, enforcements are taking place. So, so then, there are some people then that need to be moved out of office or voted out of office, if you will, if I'm hearing you correctly. Well, I think it always comes down to leadership. I think whenever you're talking about change, 
um, and, and transforming a system mm -hmm. um, and bringing about disruption that is always going to only mo happen from the outside, whether it's an outside perspective, somebody who's a part of the system. But how, does, but, but how do black Americans, particularly in this city, uh, get more involved with that? Because as you know, this city is becoming less and less black. Okay, uh, And of course, we welcome the diversity. We welcome some of the changes in the city, but we're also losing that black population, which means, of course, we're losing that power. So how do we protect those who remain in the city or those who want to come in the city? You have to, re first it starts off, you have to reclaim your history. You have to reclaim your facts. I think, you know, I love what you do and what you, that your uh, journalism um, and your storytelling is based in fact and history. Because for African Americans, because we often don't have the seat at the table, because the power wheels mm. have been kept out of our control, the influencer that we have is always fact and history. I think when okay. you, when even going back to using the, it's somewhat a bad example, but when I think about um, Emmett Till and mm -hmm. the reality of the uh, impact of imagery, it was undeniable what happened there, right? Yeah. I think about you know Martin Luther King and, right, and his assassination, it's sort of undeniable what happened there. When it becomes undeniable what happened, then the wheels of change get forced. And so I think we have to start by even you know recognizing the shifts in population but reclaiming the role that african americans have played played in building the economic opportunity that exists yeah. i use what happens it's a very simple example but sometimes the simplest things are the most powerful yeah um good and bad i use the example of the go-go movement and what happened um with the store right there at florida avenue and 7th street right yep. mm -hmm. um and the protesting you know for those that don't know uh, local sailor phone store always played go go music right there. And go go music, just just so you know, go go music is a DC uh, creation. So it came out of DC, and go go is still very popular in the city. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Drum you. based African roots, you know, that all sort of local people could get into. Young people love it, just an, a really inspirational drum based, you know, music and rhythm, right? And so it's always played that music there. And so it was always it's almost a safe gathering place. And anywhere who you are in the community connected, go, you know, you could come to that spot or, or that store. But and here, new, go -Go. And here, go go. And here, go go. And just so you all know, it's about a block south of Howard University here in DC. Yes, so right close to Howard University, um, therefore a gathering spot for many um, African American people of all different kinds, right? So new residents protest, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the noise, the noise, the noise, the noise. And the, and the that, new residents he's referring to, he's referring to the new white residents who have come into the city. Yeah, those were happen to be fact. Those were, they were right, white residents protesting the music. Well, part of what happened there, it wasn't just about the music. It was the fact that they were disrespecting, not willing to acknowledge the history that GoGo -Go has actually played in building ec also economic commerce. When yeah. we think about just the, the, the impact of GoGo -Go and Chuck Brown and entertainment and building establishment that created the now, you know, when I think about the 8th Street Corridor, when I think about what's happening, um, whether it's O Street Market or what now is the sort of Union Market area, yeah. these places where there used to be venues that African Americans used to go, right? And a lot of mm -hmm. that was go-go driven, that now is the thriving hipster, oh, kind of grungy, we want to be there. But yeah. go-go has played a heart, a, you know, major part in building that culture in the city. But now we're here, we're established, it's noise to me. Well, the community rose up, said, no, 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 this is not just about the noise. Yeah. As you hear, this is about our culture. And they showed up, shut it down, I don't know how many times, a major you know, intersection, yeah. Florida Avenue and 7th Street in D.C. And it, and it caused not just like a check on the local, you know, the residents and the mm -hmm. ANCs, but it caused a, uh, a reemergence of owning that history. Now there's a go-go museum coming. Now there's a reemergence with the uh, local young people sort of taking that go-go as also a form of telling the history of local D.C. Yeah. And so that's an example. Like it, it, it connected with younger people, older people who were connected to the sort of the foundations of go-go that started a new level of advocacy. And so that's a simple example to say that we have to claim our history. We can't let folks just say it's just noise. They're mm -hmm. just complaining again. No, it's always rooted in some facts um, connected to our experience that everything that we have done in this country, wherever city it is across America, has been connected to economic development. We were brought here and used as economic tools. And so everything that we've done, and so when you when you shut that, when they shut, we let them shut that down. We're sh letting them shut down the narrative of the role, well, our equity. Well, here's my thing. So I, I hear you, and, mm -hmm. I, and I agree with you. And we are the economic powerhouse uh, in that regard, as you talk about. And you talk about, you know, getting involved in what have you and so forth and, and getting that political power. 
But what I'm talking about, again, are protections because throughout American history, uh, we've had those kind of political uh, powers, if you will. I think about Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, where we were a, a collective body of people that were in power. You know? But you talk about the go-go music and how white residents, new residents came in and wanted to stop that. Well, I think about all the years where white residents came into cities like Wilmington, North Carolina, Chicago, Atlanta, Oconee, Florida, and they didn't like the growth, the wealth of the black community, and so they burned it all down. So who's to say that in, on some level, that's not what's happening right now in D.C.? That it's not, a, it's not a literal burning of the black community in D.C., but in some ways it's burning uh, the black community and forcing us out of the city the way it was done with Chicago, the way it was done with Atlanta, the way it was done with Wilmington, North Carolina, the way it was done with Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah, I don't disagree that that's not happening. I think, for me, it's very simple. If you don't have a seat at the table, if your voice is not present, that's what happens, right? Mm -hmm. It's an afterthought. It's 20, 30 years later where it's mm -hmm. like, oh, this is what happens, what happened. Yeah. So right now, what has to happen, why I use that Google example, they didn't wait. It was in days, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't wait after the media you know, swirl had happened. They've continued to push and push and push so and use the issue. So they fought back. Yeah, and so you have to use it to then but take the, the table, mm -hmm. build new tables, because... Mm -hmm. It's very clear, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're waiting for someone who has never wanted to give you protections, to give you protections, you are wasting your life investment. You're wasting your voice, wasting your, your yeah. resources. You have to, if you are expecting a system that exists to change, there's only two things you can do. You can build a new system or you can transform the system that exists. The only way you're going to transform the system that exists is that you have the influencers who influence that system, mm -hmm. who are carrying your message, who hold, hold your values. So you yeah. have to look at what those systems are, and then you have to put the, the representation, the leadership, the voices there that hold your values, that carry your um, expected outcomes. So in other words, th those are the only ways to get the protections that we seek. Right now, if you're looking, when, yes, looking to transform laws and regulatory laws within our you know, judicial mm -hmm. system, within our uh, legislative system, yes, you have to have the people within the system at the table who are carrying your message um, and who are willing to continue to push towards those outcomes because change is never uh, you know, a short-term process. And so you, you've got to keep continuing to push to have the influence within those systems, and you have to build new systems. Okay, but we also mean, well, from what I'm hearing then, how do we get black Americans more involved to bring about that change? Because we're in a city where we know that, I think from the last census, the population decreased by a great deal. I mean, I'm referring to the black population. I think we're somewhere now between about 40 and 45% of the black population, I mean, of the population of the city, whereas before DC was a majority black city. Okay, so... Uh, we, we have a city council uh, that is more diverse, which is a good thing, um, but uh, we don't have very many young black faces uh, on the city council. Okay, so uh, how do we get black folks involved so that they can write that legislation so that we have those protections? You gotta, you, we have to draw the connection, right? I used the Google example because uh, that was an issue that a lot of young African Americans in the city, black folks in the city, and mm -hmm. older folks of certain generations connected with, right? They launched an advocacy movement. They launched lists. They launched a network. Well, then now that network is being used. It is actually being used by folks who are um, more politically and a involved with advocacy work mm -hmm. to continue to inform them, to draw the connections between the things that they sort of care about, whether it be social life or on sort of day-to-day -day mm -hmm. things, to what's happening um, in the legislative body in the city council. And that has to continue to happen. And ultimately, from there, you have to get those individuals, young black folks or black folks of whatever age, right, who are carrying the message, who hold the values, who want to see the outcomes that we want to see. You got to get them running. If you want to transform those systems, mm -hmm. which are, you know, the legislative influencers at the city council, then you have to get those individuals, um, individuals who are carrying that message, hold those values, who want to see the outcomes you want to see. You have to get them there. And the only way to get them there within this system is that mm -hmm. they run for office. Now, I want to kind of switch topics a little bit because, again, we're talking about protections for black Americans. But, again, you have a very, very vast background. And you were, like I said, for the mayor's office when Vincent Gray was mayor. Um, but within the black community, because, you know, there are always divisions. No group is a monolith. Uh, so 
but we also know that uh, in some communities, uh, you work with the LGBTQ community. Yes. And there aren't protections there, even within the black community. So should that be a part of the overall agenda for protecting black Americans? Or is it a separate agenda? Or, or how do we bring that together? Or how do we ensure that all black Americans, regardless of their their background, are protected under, I guess, legislation that comes out in the future or current legislation or what have you? Yeah, well, I think my big thing these days, particularly on these issues, when I think about LGBTQ individuals um, and others really within the black community, is that black America, when I think of particularly American descendants of slaves and everybody else who sort of aligns themselves in the pot, um, have to understand that this is a collective a communal family move, right? When we think about protections, when we think about getting to the promised land, right? Mm -hmm. The building the beloved community. You can't get there if uh, you have left a third of yourself behind. Because I think what we consistently find happening around a lot of issues when, that affects black Americans um, is that we want to move forward for some, right, that we deem are acceptable, right? So folks that are an, against people who are uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, gender nonconforming, right, uh, whatever the labels. Um, you have the individuals within the community who are anti them, right? So we want to isolate them from the work and the movement. We want to not have them be involved, but then when it comes election time, you can't win it without them, right? You need them votes. Yeah. Not only do you need them votes, you also need their bank accounts because, oh, what? They're the ones economically driving um, nonprofit organizations and making mm -hmm. donations. They're the ones starting new uh, community-based organizations and civil society groups, right? They're the ones pushing through um, when you look at, you know, who has the degrees and the economic upper mobility. And so I think part of it is, as black people in America, we have to stop allowing the things that divided us to continue to divide us because we are losing. We do not have all the tools at the table. Mm -hmm. We do not have all the resources in our toolbox to do what we need to do because we have allowed uh, division um, to divide us from the larger goal, which is collective survival. When you talk about the reality of needing protections, because literally not only we shut out from economic opportunity, mm -hmm. but literally you're at, uh, inten intentionally being shut out from health care and health services and allowed to die. You're, so, so, mm -hmm. let me ask, so is that the first step then? So the, the, so as the community, a black community, is, is the first step for, the for us as a whole, the black community, is to come together first as a, as a, as a, as a people. And then once we are together as a people, then go for those protections that you talked about or go, for, you know, run for office on a local level, on a, a state level, on a national level. Uh, is that the first step is to yeah. come together as a whole? Yes, it has to happen. I think about, you know, when we talk about uh, Dr. King and where his message was um, before his assassination, you know, when we think about the Poor People's Campaign, it was an economic message that covered all. It wasn't an economic message for church folk. It wasn't an economic message for educated folk. It wasn't an economic message for, you know, those who had a job, you know. It was an economic message about poverty in this country, particularly black Americans, for all. And so black people have to get back there, right, around these issues of racism and discrimination that continue to prevent us from having access mm -hmm. um, to and being able to actually utilize our God God-given divine abilities to to reap the benefits of them to manifest opportunity for ourselves. I hear you, and there you have it, folks. So again, Jeffrey, thank you for joining me on this episode of the Offshoot. Thank you for having me. This is fun. <laughs> it was fun. So please, 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 please uh, check out my website, which is theoffshoot.org. Be sure to go to YouTube and subscribe to the channel so you can be aware of the next episode of The Offshoot and go to Twitter and follow me there as well. Thank you for this, watching this episode of The Offshoot and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.